Hi, my name is Richard Smith. I'm a Concord historian and the historian with the Thoreau Society. And I would like to welcome you to this virtual reading of Wild Apples by Henry David Thoreau. Um, ordinarily, we do this once a year at the visitor center at Walden Pond. And we invite readers from far and near to come and do a part of the essay. Obviously, because of the virus, we can't do that this year. So we're doing the next best thing. We're doing it virtually. Um, I would like to thank the Thoreau Society for sponsoring this event. And uh, we've got quite the cast of characters to read the uh, essay for you this year. Uh, we have uh, historians, naturalists, uh, members of the staff of Walden Pond State Reservation, members of Thoreau Society, and we have people from all over the country who are gonna be doing the readings. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, before we begin, a little bit about the essay itself. Starting in the early 1850s, uh, Henry Thoreau began keeping copious notes about the various varieties of wild apples that he would see on his walks around Concord. Uh, he didn't really do anything with these notes, but he loved apples. Uh, for him, they were cultural, they were spiritual, they were mythological, they were historic, and so he kept all kinds of notes about wild apples. He finally did something with those notes a little bit later in the 1850s. He put together a lecture called Wild Apples, and he gave that lecture twice, uh, only twice. Uh, the first time was in February of 1860, February 8th, 1860. He read it for the Concord Lyceum, and then he did it again a week later in Bedford, Massachusetts for the Bedford Lyceum. That was it. It was the only times that he read the essay in public. Um, Fast forward to about a year later, and uh, he was uh, dying from tuberculosis. He put together some of his old lectures into a publishable form so that they could be uh, presented in the Atlantic Monthly. One of those essays was Wild Apples, which was published in the Atlantic um, in November 1862. So there is the story behind the essay. And uh, without further ado, I would like to present Wild Apples by Henry David Thoreau. Wild Apples by Henry David Thoreau. It is remarkable how closely the history of the apple tree is connected with that of man. The geologist tells us that the order of the rosacea, which includes the apple, also the true grasses, and the labiata, or mints, were introduced only a short time previous to the appearance of man on the globe. It appears that apples made a part of the food of that unknown primitive people whose traces have lately been found at the bottom of the Swiss lakes, supposed to be older than the foundation of Rome, so old that they had no metallic implements. An entire black and shriveled crab apple had been recovered from their stores. Tacitus says of the ancient Germans that they satisfied their hunger with wild apples, agrestia poma, among other things. Nybor observes, quote, that the words for a house, a field, a plow, plowing, wine, oil, milk, sheep, apples, and others relating to agriculture and the gentler way of life agree in Latin and Greek, while the Latin words for all objects pertaining to war or the chase are utterly alien from the Greek. Thus, the apple tree may be considered a symbol of peace, no less than the olive. The apple was early so important and generally distributed that its name traced to its root in many languages signifies fruit in general. Melon in Greek means an apple, also the fruit of other trees, also a sheep and any cattle, and finally riches in general. The apple tree has been celebrated by the Hebrews, Greeks, Romans, and Scandinavians. Some have thought that the first human pair were tempted by its fruit. Goddesses are fabled to have contended for it, dragons were set to watch it, and heroes were employed to pluck it. The tree is mentioned in at least three places in the Old Testament, and its fruit in two or three more. Solomon sings, as the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. And again, stay me with flagons, comfort me with apples. The noblest part of man's noblest feature is named from this fruit, quote, the apple of the eye. The apple tree is also mentioned by Homer and Herodotus. 
Ulysses saw in that glorious garden of Alcinous pears and pomegranates and apple trees bearing beautiful fruit, ki malai agla karpoi. And according to Homer, apples were among the fruits which Tantalus could not pluck, the wind ever blowing their boughs away from him. Theophrastus knew and described the apple tree as a botanist. According to the prose Edda, I do not keep in a box the apples which the gods, when they feel old age approaching, have only to taste of to become young again. It is in this manner that they will be kept in renovated youth until Ragnarok, or the destruction of the gods. I learned from Loudon that the ancient Welsh bards were rewarded for excelling in song by the token of the apple spray, and in the highlands of Scotland, the apple tree is the badge of the clan Lamont. The apple tree, Pyrus malus, belongs chiefly to the northern temperate zone. Loudon says that, quote, it grows spontaneously in every part of Europe except the frigid zone and throughout Western Asia, China, and Japan. We have also two or three varieties of the apple indigenous in North America. The cultivated apple tree was first introduced into this country by the earliest settlers, and it is thought to do as well or better here than anywhere else. Probably some of the varieties which are now cultivated were first introduced into Britain by the Romans. Pliny, adopting the distinction of Theophrastus, says, quote, of trees there are some which are altogether wild, sylvestres, some more civilized, urbanores. Theophrastus includes the apple among the last, and indeed, it is in this sense the most civilized of all trees. It is as harmless as a dove, as beautiful as a rose, and as valuable as flocks and herds. It has been longer cultivated than any other, and so is more humanized. And who knows, but like the dog, it will at length be no longer traceable to its wild original. It migrates with man, like the dog and horse and cow, first perchance from Greece to Italy, thence to England, thence to America. And our Western emigrant is still marching steadily toward the setting sun with the seeds of the apple in his pocket, or perhaps a few young trees strapped to his load. At least a million apple trees are thus set farther westward this year than any cultivated ones last year. Consider how the blossom week, like the Sabbath, is thus annually spreading over the prairies. For when man migrates, he carries with him not only his birds, quadrupeds, insects, vegetables, and his very sword, but his orchard also. The leaves and tender twigs are an agreeable food to many domestic animals, as the cow, horse, sheep, and goat. And the fruit is sought after by the first, as well as by the hog. Thus there appears to have existed a natural alliance between these animals and this tree from the first. The fruit of the crab in the forests of France is said to be a great resource for the wild boar. Not only the Indian, but many indigenous insects, birds, and quadrupeds welcomed the apple tree to these shores. The tent caterpillar saddled her eggs on the very first twig that was formed, and it has since shared her affection with the wild cherry. And the canker worm also in a measure abandoned the elm to feed on it. As it grew apace, the bluebird, robin, cherry bird, kingbird, and many more came with haste and built their nests and warbled in its boughs, and so became orchard birds and multiplied more than ever. It was an era in the history of their race. The downy woodpecker found such a savory morsel under its bark that he perforated it in a ring quite round the tree before he left it, a thing which he had never done before, to my knowledge. It did not take the partridge long to find out how sweet its buds were, and every winter eve she flew and still flies from the wood to pluck them, much to the farmer's sorrow. The rabbit, too, was not slow to learn the taste of its twigs and bark, and when the fruit was ripe, the squirrel half rolled, half carried it to his hole, 
and even the musquash crept up from the bank from the brook at evening and greedily devoured it until he had worn a path in the grass there and when it was frozen and thawed the crow and the jay were glad to taste it occasionally the owl crept into the first apple tree that became hollow and fairly hooted with delight, finding it just the place for him. So settling down into it, he has remained there ever since. My theme being the wild apple, I will merely glance at some of the seasons in the annual growth of the cultivated apple and pass it on to my special province. The flowers of the apple are perhaps the most beautiful of any trees, so copious and so delicious to both sight and scent. The walker is frequently tempted to turn and linger near some more than usually handsome ones whose blossoms are two-thirds expanded. How superior it is in these respects to the pear, whose blossoms are neither colored nor fragrant. By the middle of July, green apples are so large as to remind us of coddling and of the autumn. The sward is commonly strewed with little ones which fall stillborn, as it were, nature thus thinning them for us. The Roman writer Palladius said, if apples are inclined to fall before their time, a stone placed in a split root will retain them. Some such notion still surviving may account for some of the stones which we see placed to be overgrown in the forks of trees. They have a saying in Suffolk, England, at Michaelmas time or a little before, half an apple goes to the core. Early apples begin to be ripe about the 1st of August, but I think that none of them are so good to eat as some to smell. One is worth more to scent your handkerchief with than any perfume which they sell in the shops. The fragrance of some fruits is not to be forgotten along with that of flowers. Some gnarly apple which I pick up in the road reminds me by its fragrance of all the wealth of Pomona, carrying me forward to those days when they will be collected in golden ruddy heaps in the orchards and about the cider mills. A week or two later, as you're going by the orchards and gardens, especially in the evenings, you pass through a little region possessed by the fragrance of ripe apples, and thus enjoy them without price and without robbing anybody. There is thus, about all natural products, a certain volatile and ethereal quality which re represents their highest value and which cannot be vulgarized or bought and sold. No mortal has ever enjoyed the perfect flavor of any fruit, and only the godlike among men begin to taste its ambrosial qualities, for nectar and ambrosia are only those fine flavors of every earthly fruit which our coarse palates fail to perceive, just as we occupy the heaven of the gods without knowing it. When I see a particularly mean man carrying a load of fair and fragrant early apples to market, I seem to see a contest going on between him and his horse on the one side and the apples on the other. And to my mind, the apples always gain it. Pliny says that the apples are the heaviest of all things and that the oxen begin to sweat at the mere sight of a load of them. Our driver begins to lose his load the moment he tries to transport them where they do not belong that is, to any but the most beautiful. Though he gets out from time to time and feels of them and thinks they are all there, I see the stream of their evanescent and celestial qualities going to heaven from his cart, while the pulp and skin and core are only going to market. They are not apples but pumice. Are we not still Iduna's apples, the taste of which keeps the gods forever young? And think that you, that they will let Loki or the Jassy carry them off to Jotunheim while they grow wrinkled and gray? No, for Ragnarok or the destruction of the gods is not yet. There is another thinning of the fruit, commonly near the end of August or in September, when the ground is strewn with windfalls. And this happens especially when high winds occur after rain. In some orchards, you may see fully three quarters of the whole crop on the ground lying in circular form beneath the trees, yet hard and green, or if it is a hillside, rolled far down the hill. However, it is an ill wind that blows nobody any good. All the country over, people are busy picking up the windfalls, and this will make them cheap for early apple pies. In October, the leaves falling, 
The apples are more distinct in the trees. I saw one year in a neighboring town some trees fuller of fruit than I remember to have ever seen before. Small yellow apples banging over the road. The branches were gracefully drooping with their weight, like a barberry bush, so that the whole tree acquired a new character. Even the topmost branches, instead of standing erect, spread and drooped in all directions. And there were so many poles supporting the lower ones that they looked like pictures of the banyan tree. As an old English manuscript says, the more apple in the tree beareth, the more she boweth to the folk. Surely the apple is the noblest of fruits. Let the most beautiful or the swiftest have it. That should be the going price of apples. Between the 5th and the 20th of October, I see the barrels lie under the trees. And perhaps I talk with one who is selecting some choice barrels to fulfill an order. He turns a specked one over many times before he leaves it out. If I were to tell what is passing in my mind, I should say that every one was specked which he had handled, for he rubs off all the bloom and those fugacious ethereal qualities leave it. Cool evenings prompt the farmers to make haste, and, and at length I see only the ladders here and left there left leaning against the trees. It would be well if we accepted these fruits with more joy and gratitude and did not think of it simply to put a fresh load of compost about the tree. Some old English customs are suggest suggestive at least. I find them described chiefly in Brand's Popular Antiquity. It appears that on Christmas Eve, the farmers and their men in Devonshire take an old bowl of cider with a toast in it and carrying it in a state to the orchard they salute the apple trees with much ceremony in order to make them bear well the next season. This salutation consists in throwing some of the cider about the roots of the tree, placing bits of the toast on the branches, and then encircling one of the best bearing trees in the orchard. They drink the following toast three several times. Here's to thee, old apple tree, when thou mayst bud and whence thou may blow. And whence thou mayst bear apples and oh, hats full, caps full, bushel, bushel, sacks full, and my pockets full too. Hurrah! Also, what was called apple howling used to be practiced in various counties of England on New Year's Eve. A troop of boys visited the different orchards and, encircling the apple trees, repeated the following words Stand fast, root, bear well, top. Pray God send us a good howling crop. Every twig, apples big. Every bow, apples a no. They then shout in chorus, one of the boys accompanying them on a cow's horn. During this ceremony, they wrap the trees with their sticks. This is called wassailing. The trees and is thought by some to be a relic of the heathen sacrifice to Pomona. Herrick sings, Wassail the trees that they may bear, you may a plum and many a pear. For more or less fruits they will bring, as you so give them wassailing. Our poets have as yet a better right to sing of cider than of wine but it behooves them to sing better than English Phillips did, else they will do no credit to their muse. So much for the more civilized apple trees, or Benny Horries, as Pliny calls them. I love better to go through the old orchards of ungrafted apple trees at whatever season of the year. So irregularly planted, sometimes two trees standing close together, and the rows so devious that you would think that they not only had grown while the owner was sleeping, but had been set out by him in a somnambulic state. The rows of grafted fruit will never tempt me to wander amid them like these. But I now, alas, speak rather from memory 
than from any recent experience, such ravages have been made. Some soils, like a rocky tract called the Easterbrook's country in my neighborhood, are so suited to the apple that it will grow faster in them without any care. Or if the ground is broken up once a year, and it will in many places with any amount of care. The owners of this tract allow that the soil is excellent for fruit, but they say that it is so rocky that they have not patience to plow it. And that, together with the distance, is the reason why it is not cultivated. There are, or were recently, extensive orchards there standing without order. Nay, they spring up wild and bear well there in the midst of pines, birches, maples, and oaks. I am often surprised to see rising amid these trees the rounded tops of apple trees, glowing with red or yellow fruit, in harmony with the autumnal tints of the forest. Going up the side of a cliff about the first of November, I saw a vigorous young apple tree, which, planted by birds or cows, had shot up amid the rocks and open woods there, and had now much fruit on it, uninjured by the frosts, when all cultivated apples were gathered. It was a rank, wild growth, with many green leaves on it still, and made an impression of thorniness. The fruit was hard and green, but looked as if it would be palatable in the winter. Some was dangling on the twigs, but more half buried in the wet leaves under the tree, or rolled far down the hill amid the rocks. The owner knows nothing of it. The day was not observed when it first blossomed, nor when it first bore fruit, unless by the chickadee. There was no dancing on the green beneath it in its honor, and now there is no hand to pluck its fruit, which is only gnawed by squirrels, as I perceive. It has done double duty, not only borne this crop, but each twig has grown a foot into the air. And this is such fruit, bigger than many berries, we must admit, and carried home will be sound and palatable next spring. What care I for Arduna's apples, so long as I can get these? When I go by this shrub thus late and hardy, and see its dangling fruit, I respect the tree, and I am grateful for nature's bounty, even though I cannot eat it. Here, on this rugged and woody hillside, has grown an apple tree, not planted by man, no relic of a former orchard, but a natural growth, like the pines and oaks. Most fruits which we prize and use depend entirely on our care. Corn and grain, potatoes, peaches, melons, etc., depend altogether on our planting. But the apple emulates man's independence and enterprise. It is not simply carried, as I have said, but like him to some extent. It has migrated to this new world and is even here and there making its way amid the aboriginal trees, just as the ox and dog and horse sometimes run wild and maintain themselves. Even the sourest and crabbedest of apples, growing in the most unfavorable conditions, suggest such thoughts as these. It is so noble, a fruit. The crab. Nevertheless, our wild apple is wild only like myself, perchance, who belong not to the aboriginal race here, but have strayed into the woods from the cultivated stock. 
Wilder still, as I have said, there grows elsewhere in this country a native and aboriginal crabapple, Malus coronaria, whose nature has not yet been modified by cultivation. It is found from western New York to Minnesota and southward. Michaud says that its ordinary height is 15 or 18 feet, but it's sometimes found 25 or 30 feet high, and that the large ones exactly resemble the common apple tree. The flowers are white mingled with rose color and are collected in corums. They are remarkable for their delicious odor. The fruit, according to him, is about an inch and a half in diameter and is intensely acid, yet they make fine sweetmeats and also cider of them. He concludes that, if on being cultivated it does not yield new and palatable varieties, it will at least be celebrated for the beauty of its flowers and for the sweetness of its perfume. I never saw the crab apple till May 1861. I had heard of it through Michaud, but more modern botanists, so far as I know, have not treated it as of any peculiar importance. Thus it was a half-fabulous tree to me. I contemplated a pilgrimage to the glades, a portion of Pennsylvania where it was said to grow to perfection. I thought of sending to a nursery for it, but doubted if they had it or would distinguish it from European varieties. At last, I had occasion to go to Minnesota, and on entering Michigan, I began to notice from the cars a tree with the handsome rose-colored flowers. At first, I thought it some variety of thorn, but it was not long before the truth flashed on me that this was my long-sought crab apple. It was the prevailing flowering shrub or tree to be seen from the cars at that season of the year, about the middle of May. But the cars never stopped before one, and so I was launched onto the bosom of the Mississippi, without having touched one, experiencing the fate of Tantalus. On arriving at St. Anthony's Falls, I was sorry to be told that I was far too north for the crab apple. Nevertheless, I succeeded in finding it about eight miles west of the falls touched it and smelled it and secured a lingering quorum of flowers for my herbarium. This must have been near its northern limit. How the wild apple grows. But though these are indigenous like the Indians, I doubt whether they are any hardier than those backwoodsmen among the apple trees, which though descended from cultivated stocks, plant themselves in distant fields and forests where the soil is favorable to them. I know of no trees which have more difficulties to contend with and which more sturdily resist their foes. These are the ones whose story we have to tell. It oftentimes reads thus. Near the beginning of May, we noticed little thickets of apple trees just springing up in the pastures where cattle have been. As the rocky ones of our Easterbrook's country or the top of Knobscot Hill in Sudbury. One or two of these perhaps survived the drought and other accidents, their very birthplace defending them against the encroaching grass and some other dangers at first. In two years' time, it had thus reached the level of the rocks, admired the stretching world, nor feared the wandering flocks, but at this tender age, its sufferings began. There came a browsing ox and cut it down a span. This time, perhaps, the ox does not notice it amid the grass, but the next year, when it has grown more stout, he recognizes it for a fellow emigrant from the old country the flavor of whose leaves and twigs he well knows. And though at first he pauses to welcome it and express his surprise and gets for answer, the same cause that brought you here brought me. He nevertheless rouses it again, reflecting it may be that he has some title to it. Thus cut down annually, it does not despair, but putting forth two short twigs for every one cut off, it spreads out low along the ground in the hollows or between the rocks, growing more stout and scrubby, until it forms not a tree as yet, but a little pyramidal, stiff, twiggy mass, almost as solid and impenetrable as a rock. Some of the densest and most impenetrable clumps of bushes that I have ever seen 
as well on account of the closeness and stubbornness of their branches as of their thorns, have been these wild apple scrubs. They are more like the scrubby fir and black spruce on which you stand and sometimes walk on the tops of mountains where cold is the demon they contend with more than anything else. No wonder they are prompted to grow thorns at last to defend themselves against such foes. In their thorniness, however, there is no malice, only some malic acid. The rocky pastures of the tract I have referred to for they maintain their ground best in a rocky field, are thickly sprinkled with these little tufts, reminding you often of some rigid gray mosses or lichens. And you see thousands of little trees just springing up between them with the seeds still attached to them. Being regularly clipped all around each year by the cows as a hedge with shears, they're often of a perfect conical or pyramidal form from one to four feet high and more or less sharp, as if trimmed by the gardener's art. In the pastures on Knobscot Hill and its spurs, they make fine dark shadows when the sun is low. They are also an excellent covert from hawks, for many small birds that roost and build in them. Whole flocks perch in them at night, and I have seen three robins nest in one, which was six feet in diameter. No doubt many of these are already old trees, if you reckon from the day they were planted, but infants still when you consider their development and the long life before them. I counted the annual rings of some which were just one foot high and as wide as high and found that they were about 12 years old were quite sound and thrifty. They were so low that they were unnoticed by the walker while many of their contemporaries from the nursery were already bearing considerable crops. But what you gain in time is perhaps in this case too lost in power that is, in the vigor of the tree. This is their pyramidal state. The cows continue to browse them thus for 20 years or more, keeping them down and compelling them to spread until at last they are so broad that they become their own fence when some interior shoot, which their foes cannot reach, darts upward with joy, for it has not forgotten its high calling and bears its own peculiar fruit in triumph. Such are the tactics by which it finally defeats its bovine foes. <clears throat> now, if you have watched the progress of a particular shrub, you will see that it is no longer a simple pyramid or cone, but that out of its apex, there rises a sprig or two, growing more lustily perchance than an orchard tree, since the plant now devotes the whole of its repressed energy to these upright parts. In a short time, these become a small tree, an inverted pyramid resting on the apex of the other, so that the whole has now the form of a vast hourglass. The spreading bottom, having served its purpose, finally disappears, and the generous tree permits the now harmless cows to come in and stand in its shade and rub against and redden its trunk, which has grown in spite of them, and even to taste a part of its fruit, and so disperse the seed. Thus the cows create their own shade and food, and the tree, its hourglass being inverted, lives a second life, as it were. It is an important question with some nowadays whether you should trim young apple trees as high as your nose or as high as your eyes. The ox trims them as high as he can reach, and that is about the right height, I think. In spite of wandering kine and other adverse circumstances, that despised shrub, valued only by small birds as a covert and shelter from hawks, has its blossom week at last, and in course of time, its harvest, sincere though small. By the end of some October, when its leaves have fallen, I frequently see such a central sprig whose progress I have watched when I thought it had forgotten its destiny as I had, bearing its first crop of small green or yellow or rosy fruit, which the cows cannot get at over the bushy and thorny hedge which surrounds it, and I make haste to taste the new and undescribed variety. We have all heard of the numerous varieties of fruit invented by Van Mons and Knight. This is the system of Van Cow and she has invented far more 
and more memorable varieties than both of them. Hardships it may attain to bear a sweet fruit. Though somewhat small, it may prove equal, if not superior in flavor to that which is grown in the garden. Will perchance be all the sweeter and more palatable for the very difficulties it had to contend with. Who knows but this chance wild fruit, planted by a cow or a bird on some remote and rocky hillside, where it is yet unobserved by man, may be the choicest of all of its kind, and foreign potentates shall hear of it, and royal societies seek to propagate it, though the virtues of perhaps the truly crabbed owner of the soil may never be heard of, at least beyond the limits of his village. It was thus the porter and the Baldwin grew. Every wild apple shrub excites our expectations thus, and somewhat as every wild child. It is perhaps a prince in disguise, what a lesson to man. So are human beings referred to as the highest standard, the celestial fruit, which they suggest and aspire to bear, browsed on by fate, and the strongest genius defends itself and prevails, and sends a tender scion upwards at last, and drops its perfect fruit on the ungrateful earth. Poets and philosophers and statesmen thus spring up in the country pastures and outlast the hosts of unoriginal men. Such is always the pursuit of knowledge. The celestial fruits, the golden apples of the Hesperides, are ever guarded by a hundred-headed dragon which never sleeps, so that it is a Herculean labor to pluck them. This one, the most remarkable way in which the wild apple is propagated, but commonly it springs up at wild intervals in woods and swamps and by the sides of the roads, as the soil may suit it, and grows with comparative rapidity. Those which grow in dense woods are very tall and slender. I frequent, frequently pluck from these trees a perfectly mild and tamed fruit. As Palladius says, a king yes do concert to not to uber mali and the ground is strewn with the fruit of an unbidden apple tree it is an old notion that if these wild trees do not bear a valuable fruit of their own they are the best stocks of which to transmit to posterity the most highly prized qualities of others however i am not in search of stocks but the wild fruit itself, whose fierce gust has suffered no intenderation. It is not my highest plot to plant the bergamot. The time for wild apples is the last of October and the first of November. They then get to be palatable, for they ripen late, and they are still perhaps as beautiful as ever. I make a great account of these fruits, which the farmers do not think it worth to wa the while to gather. Wild flavors of the muse, vivacious and inspiriting. The farmer thinks that he has better in his barrels, but he is mistaken unless he has a walker's appetite and imagination, neither of which can he have. Such as grow quite wild and are left out till the first of November, I presume that the owner does not mean to gather. They belong to children as wild as themselves, to certain active boys that I know, to the wild-eyed woman of the fields to whom nothing comes amiss, who gleans after all the world, and moreover, to us walkers. We have met with them and they are ours. These rights, long enough insisted upon, have come to be an institution in some old countries where they have learned how to live. I hear that the custom of griffling, which may be called apple gleaning, is or was formerly practiced in Herefordshire. It consists in leaving a few apples, which are called the griffles, on every tree after the general gathering for the boys who go with climbing poles and bags to collect them. As for those I speak of, I pluck them as a wild fruit, native to this quarter of the earth fruit of old trees that have been dying ever since I was a boy and are not yet dead, frequented only by the woodpecker and the squirrel, deserted now by the owner who has not faith enough to look under their boughs. From the appearance of the treetop, 
at a little distance. You would expect nothing but lichens to drop from it, but your faith is rewarded by finding the ground strewn with spirited fruit. Some of it perhaps collected at squirrel holes with the marks of their teeth by which they carried them. Some containing a cricket or two silently feeding within and some, especially in damp days, a shell-less snail. The very sticks and stones lodged in the treetop might have convinced you of the savoriness of the fruit, which has been so eagerly sought after in past years. I have seen no account of these among the fruit and fruit trees of America, though they are more memorable to my taste than the grafted kinds, more racy and wild. American flavors do they possess when October and November, when December and January, and perhaps February and March even, have assuaged them somewhat. An old farmer in my neighborhood who always selects the right word says that they have a kind of bow arrow tang. Apples for grafting appear to have been selected commonly, not so much for their spirited flavor as for their mildness, their size, and bearing qualities. Not so much for their beauty as for their fairness and soundness. Indeed, I have no faith in the selected list of pomological gentlemen. Their favorites and none suches and seek no farthers when I have fruited them commonly turn out very tame and forgettable. They are eaten with comparatively little zest and have no real tang nor smack to them. What if some of these wildings are acrid and puckery, genuine burgess? Do they not still belong to the pomace, which are uniformly innocent and kind to our race? I still begrudge them to the cider mill. Perhaps they are not fairly ripe yet. No wonder that these small and high colored apples are thought to make the best cider. Luden quotes from the Herefordshire report that apples of a small size are always, if equal in quality, to be preferred to those of a larger size in order that the rind and kernel may bear the greatest proportion to the pulp, which affords the weakest and most watery juice. And he says that to prove this, Dr. Simmons of Hereford, about the year 1800, made one hogshead of cider entirely from the rinds and cores of apples, and another from the pulp only. When the first was found of extraordinary strength and flavor, while the latter was sweet and insipid. Evelyn says that the red straight was the favorite cider apple in his day, and he quotes one Dr. Newberg as saying, in Jersey, tis a general observation, as I hear, that the more of red any apple has in its rind, the more proper it is for their use. Pale-faced apples, they exclude as much as may be from their cider vat. This opinion still prevails. All apples are good in November. Those which the farmer leaves out as unsaleable or unpalatable, to those who frequent the markets are choicest fruit to the walker. But it is remarkable that the wild apple, which I praise as so spirited and racy when eaten in the fields or woods, being brought into the house has frequently a harsh and crab taste. The saunterer's apple, not even the saunterer can eat in the house. The palate rejects it there as it does haws and acorns and demands a tamed one, for there you miss the November air, which is the sauce it is to be eaten with. Accordingly, when Tyderus, seeing the lengthening shadows, invites Melibus to go home and pass the night with him, he promises him mild apples and soft chestnuts. Midiapoma, castanet moles. I frequently pluck wild apples of so rich and spicy a flavor that I wonder all orchidists do not get a scion from that tree. And I fail not to bring home my pockets full. But perchance when I take one out of my desk and taste it in my chamber, I find it unexpectedly crude, sour enough to set a squirrel's teeth on edge and make a jay scream. These apples have hung in the wind and the frost and rain till they have absorbed the qualities of the weather or the season, and thus are highly seasoned, and they pierce and sting and permeate us with their spirit. They must be eaten in season accordingly, that is, out of doors. To appreciate the wild and sharp flavors of these October fruits, it is necessary that you be breathing the sharp October or November air. The outdoor air and exercise which the walker gets gives a different tone to his palate, and he craves a fruit 
which the sedentary would call harsh and crabbed. They must be eaten in the fields when your system is all aglow with exercise, when the frosty weather nips your fingers, and the wind rattles the bare boughs or rustles the few remaining leaves, and the jay is heard screaming around. What is sour in the house, a bracing walk makes sweet. Some of these apples might be labeled to be eaten in the wind. Of course, no flavors are thrown away. They are intended for the taste that is up to them. Some apples have two distinct flavors, and perhaps one half of them must be eaten in the house, the other outdoors. One Peter Whitney wrote from Northborough in 1782 for the proceedings of the Boston Academy, describing an apple tree in town producing fruit of opposite qualities, part of the same apple being frequently sour and the other sweet. Also, some all sour and others all sweet and this diversity on all parts of the tree. There is a wild apple on Noshituck Hill in my town, which has to me a peculiar, pleasant, bitter tang, not perceived till it is three quarters tasted. It remains on the tongue. As you eat it, it smells exactly like a squash bug. It is a sort of triumph to eat and relish it. I hear that the fruit of a kind of plum tree in Provence it's called Prunus sibilaris because it is impossible to whistle after having eaten them from their sourness. But perhaps they were only eaten in the house and in summer. And if tried out of doors in a stinging atmosphere, who knows, but you could whistle an octave higher and clearer. In the fields only are the sours and bitters of nature appreciated. Just as the woodchopper eats his meal in a sunny glade in the middle of a winter day, with content, basks in a sunny ray there and dreams of summer in a degree of cold which, experienced in a chamber, would make a student miserable. They who are at work abroad are not cold, but rather it is they who sit shivering in houses. As with temperatures, so with flavors. As with cold and heat, so with sour and sweet. This natural raciness, the sours and the bitters, which the diseased palate refuses, are the true condiments. Let your condiments be in the condition of your senses. To appreciate the flavor of these wild apples requires vigorous and healthy senses, papillae, firm and erect on the tongue and palate, not easily flattened and tamed. From my experience with wild apples, I can understand that there may be reason for savages preferring many kinds of food which civilized man rejects. The former has the palate of an outdoor man. It takes a savage or wild taste to appreciate a wild fruit. What a healthy out of door appetite it takes to relish the apple of life, the apple the world then. Nor is it every apple I desire nor that pleases every palate best. Tis not the lasting duan I require, not yet the red cheek greening I request, nor that which first bestrewed the name of wife, nor that whose beauty caused the golden strife. No, no, bring me an apple from the tree of life. So there is one thought for the field, another for the house. I would have my thoughts like wild apples, to be food for walkers and will not warrant them to be palatable if tasted in the house. Their beauty. Almost all wild apples are handsome. They cannot be too gnarly and crabbed and rusty to look at. The gnarliest will have some redeeming traits even to the eye. You will discover some evening redness dashed or sprinkled on some protuberance or in some cavity. It is rare that the summer lets an apple go without streaking or spotting it on some part of its sphere. It will have some red stains commemorating the mornings and evenings it has witnessed. Some dark and rusty blotches in memory of the clouds and foggy, mildewy days that have passed over it and a spacious field of green reflecting the general face of nature. Green even as the fields 
or a yellow ground, which implies a milder flavor, yellow as the harvest, or russet as the hills. Apples, these I mean, unspeakably fair, apples of not discord, but of concord, yet not so rare, but that the homeliest may have a share. Painted by the frost, some a uniform clear bright yellow or red or crimson, as if their spheres had regularly revolved and enjoyed the influence of the sun on all sides alike. Some with the faintest pink blush imaginable, some brindled with deep red streaks like a cow, or with hundreds of fine blood red rays running regularly from the stem dimple to the blossom end, like meridional lines on a straw colored ground. Some touched with a greenish rust like a fine lichen, here and there with crimson blotches or eyes more or less confluent and fiery when wet, and others gnarly and freckled or peppered all over on the stem side with fine crimson spots on a white ground as if accidentally sprinkled from the brush of him who paints the autumn leaves. Others again are sometimes red inside, perfused with a beautiful blush, fairy food, too beautiful to eat, apple of the Hesperides, apple of the evening sky. But like shells and pebbles on the seashore, they must be seen as they sparkle amid the withering leaves in some dell in the woods in the autumnal air or as they lie in the wet grass and not when they have wilted and faded in the house. The Last Gleaning By the middle of November, the wild apples have lost some of their brilliancy and have chiefly fallen. A great part are decayed on the ground and the sound ones are more palatable than before. The note of the chickadee sounds now more distinct as you wander amid the old trees, and the autumnal dandelion is half closed and tearful. But still, if you are a skillful gleaner, you may get many a pocketful, even of grafted fruit, long after apples are supposed to be gone out of doors. I know a, bla a blue pearmain tree growing within the edge of a swamp almost as good as wild. You would not suppose that there was any fruit left there on the first survey, but you must look according to the system. Those which lie exposed are quite brown and rotten now, or perchance a few still show one blooming cheek here and there amid the wet leaves. Nevertheless, with experienced eyes, I explore amid the bare elders and the huckleberry bushes and the withered sedge and in the crevices of the rocks which are full of leaves and pry into the fallen and decaying ferns which, with apple and alder leaves, thickly strew the ground. For I know that they lie concealed, fallen into hollows long since covered up by the leaves of the tree itself, a proper kind of fatty. From these lurking places, anywhere within the circumference of the tree, I draw forth the fruit, all wet and glossy, maybe nibbled by rabbits and hollowed out by crickets, and perhaps with a leaf or two cemented to it as Curzon, an old manuscript from a monastery's moldy cellar, but still with a rich bloom on it, and at least as ripe and well kept, if not better than those in barrels, more crisp and lively than they. If these resources fail to yield anything, I have learned to look between the bases of the suckers, which spring thickly from some horizontal limb, and now and then one lodges there, or in the very midst of an alder clump, where they are covered by leaves, safe from cows which may have smelt them out. If I am sharp set, for I do not refuse the blue pearmain, I fill my pockets on each side, and as I retrace my steps in the frosty eve, being perhaps four or five miles from home, I eat first from this side, and then from that, to keep in balance. Toward the end of November, though some of the sound ones are yet more mellow and perhaps more edible, they have generally, like the leaves, lost their beauty and are beginning to freeze. It is finger cold, and prudent farmers get in their barreled apples and bring you the apples and cider which they have engaged for it is time to put them into the cellar perhaps a few on the ground show their red cheeks above the early snow and occasionally some even preserve their color and soundness though under the snow throughout the winter but generally at the beginning of the winter they freeze hard
and soon, though undecayed, acquire the color of a baked apple. Before the end of December, generally, they experience their first thawing. Those which a month ago were sour, crabbed, and quite unpalatable to the civilized taste, such at least as were frozen while sound, yet a warmer sun come to thaw them, for they are extremely sensitive to its rays, are found to be filled with a rich, sweet cider, better than any bottled cider that I know of, and with which I'm better acquainted than with wine. All apples are good in this state, and your jaws are the cider pressed. Others, which have more substance, are sweet and luscious food, in my opinion, of more worth than the pineapples, which are imported from the West Indies. Those which lately even I tasted, only to repent it, for I am a semi-civilized, which the farmer willingly left on the tree. I am now glad to have found the property of, of hanging on like leaves of the young oaks. It is a way to keep cider sweet without boiling. Let the frost come to freeze them first, solid as stones, and then the rain or a warm winter day to thaw them, and they will seem to have borrowed a flavor from heaven through the medium of the air in which they hang. Or perchance you find when you get home that those which rattled in your pocket have thawed and the ice is turned to cider. But after the third or fourth freezing and thawing, they will not be good. And there you have it, our virtual reading of Wild Apples by Henry David Thoreau. If you were wondering which version that we were using, it is actually the original printed edition from the Atlantic Monthly from November 1862. And if you would like to see that version, there'll be a link below in the description box to this video. Uh, I would like to thank the Thoreau Society for sponsoring this reading. I would absolutely love to thank all of our readers who took part in this. And more importantly, I would like to thank each and every one of you for watching our program. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, if you are interested in more information about the Thoreau Society, you can go to thoroughsociety.org and you can find out all about what we do and why we do it and why we are so obsessed with this man named Henry David Thoreau. So once again, thank you for joining us. Have a great day.